everyone. We've got a couple people back in the foyer there. If you join us in the sanctuary, uh, we're going to stand and turn to page 157. Yeah, 157. Yeah, that's correct. Um, Come, thou almighty king, page 157. second verse. Come thou incarnate word, gird on us the mighty sword, our prayer attend. Come in thy people bless, and give thy word success. Jeremy, if you could open us up in prayer. Oh, Father, Lord, just saying that we can be in your house tonight, Lord, and, and dear Lord, just uh, uh, be with us um, and help us to focus on your word and, and the message you have for us, Lord, and, and Lord, please hear our requests tonight, Lord. Thank you for all, your, all you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated real quick. Uh, thanks, Everybody who's here for, for coming out tonight, uh, of course, you all know uh, everything going on with Pastor and losing, uh, losing his dad recently, uh, so he's not here tonight. He's down in, in Delaware uh, with his family, spending some time with them, so uh, keep praying for him and, uh, and for his family during this time. And uh, as far as any other announcements, I don't, I don't have any right now, so we'll just go right to our memory verse real quick, uh, Philippians chapter 4. If you could turn, turn there with me real quick. I've been looking at verse number 9. Philippians 4, verse number 9. And if you're there, if you read that nice and loud, may it says... Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. There it is, Philippians 4, verse 9. Anybody working on that wants to give it a shot tonight, feel free. The pins did come in, so I got some, some IOUs to, uh, to, to get back. I owe Eli a pin, I know that, and uh, there's a couple others. But anybody working on that now? Not tonight? Okay. All right, we'll sing another song, Jeremy. All right, if you'd stand once again, we're going to go back one page to page 156. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Page 156. Oh, uh-huh. 
try again on a second verse here, page 156. There is no name on earth or heaven above. Bibles with me to Psalm 46, Psalm chapter 46, I needed a, uh, an encouraging sort of a, a message, I don't know if, uh, it, it, se- it seems to be pretty common, but like it's getting dark earlier and it is, it's depressing it, and uh, it, it's just like a, an extra little flick of the domino that just, uh, it, just messes, it just messes with your head. It, it does for me. I'm, uh, it probably does for other people too. But, uh, but yeah, I, I love this psalm because, because it's, it's such an encouragement to me, such a help to me. So I hope, I hope that what we, what we talk about and, and, and think on is a, is a help and an encouragement to you too tonight. So we're there in Psalm chapter 46. I'm going to read that psalm. Real quick, starting in verse 1, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah, there is a river The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the ends of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Let's pray real quick. Father, thank you so much again, Lord, for your word, for your people who are, are come here tonight. Lord, and there are, there is 
There is so much that, uh, that, that troubles your people. And Father, we pray that as we, as we take some time to meditate on your word and to, uh, to look at the things and go to the places that uh, you've, you've pictured for us here, to think on the thoughts that you've, you've uh, held out for us to put into our mind, Lord, that, that, they would, that they would have the desired effect and that it would bring us comfort and that it would fill us with the peace of God that passeth knowledge. Lord, we need it so much. We, we are a needy people who, who need a strong Savior, Lord, every day, every moment, every season. And Lord, we pray that we would, we would be a people that looks to you always. Father, we pray that you'd help us tonight. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I just preached the last time I preached on the Psalms. I love, I love the Psalms. I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful that, that we have the book of Psalms. They just, they just go to a lot of places that we often are uh, in our minds. And, and they just capture a lot of the things that, that, uh, that, that go through our minds, uh, sometimes unnoticed by us. And they are, uh, they're, they're useful. They, they have a purpose of guiding our hearts and our minds to some place, to some conclusion. Uh, like it says in the New Testament, that, that verse about uh, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs because uh, it, there's, there's something about a song, there's something about the, uh, uh, that, that emotional aspect of, of, uh, of us and mixing God's truth with that part of us that really makes it stick and really, really carries us in, in a certain direction. And this psalm is, a, is such a, I, I love this psalm so much. Um, it's, a, it's a psalm that you go to when you're uh, in distress and you're overwhelmed and you're uh, afraid and you're discouraged. And I, I read somewhere that Martin Luther, like the Reformation, Reformation guy, Martin Luther, he, he would, uh, whenever bad news of any kind came up, he'd, he'd say to his congregation, come, let us sing the 46th. Psalm. It's just, it's just so full of, of, of good, of, of good thoughts, of, of, of a better, of a better way of thinking about, about the situation. Because life is really exhausting. It, it really, really uh, has, there, there's so many burdens that we carry every day that prod at us and that, that just poke at our hearts and minds daily, moment by moment. There's work stress and there's family stress and there's stress about, you know, news going on in the world. And we grow pessimistic with all of that stuff, a lot of the political stuff that happens. There's spiritual battles and trials and temptations that happen you know, every, every moment just about. Every moment there's something trying to take our hearts away from, from God in, in some way and in some degree. And there's just, there's an abundance of anxieties and, and fears and, and just dark, dark thoughts that can beset you just randomly. Uh, there's a lot that, that we go through. And we, we sometimes walk a pretty wearisome road. But God gave us his word. He gave us things like this, what we just read, uh, to remind us that even though our way is, is not certain, that, that he is certain, that he is a definite, that he is our rock. And there's some things that I see that God wants us to know from this psalm. Uh, there's three things... Just in the first verse, that if we can, if we can grab onto tight enough, it's a game changer. You look at there at verse at verse one. It begins, "God is our refuge." 
You know, ref a refuge is somewhere where you run to hide from danger. When things feel scary, you can go to him and you find safety from all the things that are brewing outside. And he keeps us safe physically as we go throughout our day. He keeps us, he can keep us safe mentally and emotionally throughout the day. Ultimately, he keeps us safe spiritually from, from death and from hell. another verse I love in Psalm 18. It says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The, right, the righteous runneth into it and is safe. He's a refuge. He's like a storm shelter that uh, people can run into to, to be safe from things. And God is saying, come to me when you're afraid. He's a refuge. Come to me when you need shelter from the, things, from the things that are worrying you, from the things that are, are just filling you with that, uh, like, like that one hymn says, that nameless dread and fear sometimes. Come, come to me, I will keep you safe. Hide in here. Come in here where, where it's safe. Be with me. He also says, uh, God is, it's, it says, God is our refuge and strength. He's your strength. He's how you will continue. He's how you'll finish your work day without flipping out at your coworkers. He's how you're going to wake up in the morning and how you're going to get out of bed. And he's how you're going to bear with the trials that are waiting for you that day uh, that you don't know about yet. Without fainting in your faith. There's so many things that make us want to, want to faint in our faith and, and just throw our hands up at the whole thing sometimes. It's, 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 there's so many things that frustrate us. Life can be very discouraging, uh, and, and it can be so discouraging, sometimes you just grow weary with the, with, with the whole Christian walk. You can grow weary of uh, hearing preaching and, and reading God's Word because it just kind of gets tired to hear of the ideals that you, you ought to be that you just don't feel right now. Sometimes you could go through uh, one of those times where you just feel like everything is wrong and it's coming at you from, from all directions at once and you just throw your hands up at the whole thing. There's no shortage of trouble in this life and so we look to God as we, we, we need somewhere to go from that trouble. And, and we need strength to face that trouble. And that is what he is. And, and that, that is what he wants to be to you. I love the verse in the New Testament where uh, Jesus uh, says to take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy my burden is light. Sometimes we think, I don't, I don't feel like that about the Christian life. Sometimes it feels kind of uh, heavy. And, and too often the reason that it feels heavy, I think, is because we're, we're trying to, to, to push this thing forward without him as our strength and, and not hiding in, in God our refuge and not, not looking to him as our strength. We're trying to, trying to push that plow uh, forward on our own. And that's a burden. And that's tiresome, and that's wearisome. We grow weary, but he does not. God reminds us of our need for him to be our strength, uh, our whole thing. Isaiah 40, 31, I've always loved this verse, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Their strength is renewed continually. Uh, I mean, we continually need that. There's no, uh, there's no point where you're filled up so much that you can just, you know, that, that you can just go on without him. You know, it's not like you have a, a tank where you can fill up for a while. Uh, you, you don't have a tank at all. You need to be plugged in, always with him. And the third thing that I see in that verse that, that I, I want to point out is that it says he is a, he, it says God is our refuge and strength 
a very present help in trouble. A very present help. And you see there that God describes, he doesn't just say that he is a present help. I, I, I think every word is there for a reason, and I checked, and that's not one of those italicized words that, that are added for syntax. Uh, that, that, that word is there. The word very, it matters a lot. I, I looked up that word. And uh, it's a word that's translated in other places as, as greatly, exceedingly. One of the definitions was uh, muchness, which is, I don't, I don't say that word that way too often. Uh, so it stood out to me. It, muchness. Uh, he's, there, he's there with a muchness. He isn't just, just present. He's like really, really definitely there. You ever pay attention to when things grow weary and and discouraging uh, to your perception of how close you think God is to you at that time? We don't don't see him, so we have this tendency of uh, viewing him as being sort of far away, somewhere, somewhere in outer space, right, like that song. He's, he's up high and away and, and far out of reach and, and aloof to, to us and what we're going through. Um, it's almost like we view him just like up, up in heaven away from what we're going through. And I like what Paul, when he's at Mars Hill in, in Acts 17, uh, he, he's talking to these lost people. Uh, these Stoics and Epicureans and philosophers, and he says to them uh, about God that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and, and have our being. We can't even live and move and have our being without him having some sort of direct role in that. He's... He says, though he be not far from every one of us. And if he can say that to an amphitheater full of of lost people, that he's not far from them, uh, how much more can we say that who are made even more nigh by the blood of Christ? He is, he's near. New Testament uh, verses uh, like this one, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you in, in James. Everything in the scriptures uh, indicates like a, a nearness of God. That he's there in the trenches with us. And it's a natural in human inclination to view him as, as, not, as not there. But really it's the opposite of what we expect. Everything that God says just in the first verse here about himself should bring us so much comfort. In those three statements, we see that God wants to be near us. He wants to comfort us. Sometimes in all of those discouragements, uh, we make God into the opposite of those those three things, someone who's not willing to, to take us in and not willing to supply the strength that we need and not willing to be near us, but, but uh, choosing to be far from us. But that's not what we read there. That's not, that's not what it says. Just in that first verse, it's, it's like he's saying, anytime you feel in distress or in danger, uh, I can hide you and keep you safe. Don't worry about being strong enough. Don't worry about uh, trying to be what you think you're supposed to be as, as a Christian. You can't do it, and you're not going to be able to. But, but, but I, can, I can supply that. You need me to do it. I will be your strength for you. I'm here. I'm available to help the moment you ask. I'm, I'm the real solution to uh, where you are right now. What does God look like in your head? I, I think about that. 
a lot. And I, I say things like that a lot because I, I think it, it is just something that we deal with like by the second sometimes. And, and it's in those like, you know, those micro moments that, that the macro trends uh, start to play out in our life. Do we view God the way that he describes himself? Uh, or do we just want to believe that about God, but then when, then when things get real, we just kind of limp through it without him? We know verses like this are in there, but, but do, do we find any real power in them? When things get stressful, when things get scary, when things get overwhelming. And that's not me saying that if you don't feel the peace of God that, that passeth knowledge uh, in the middle of your problems, then, then you're not right with God. I'm not saying that at all. It's me saying, uh, look at what is available to us. Look, look, at, what God, look, look at what God is. God's never... He's never, he's never in, the, uh, in the earthquake or in the fire, like that, that story with Elijah. He's always in, the, in the, still, the still small voice. He's your refuge. He's your strength. He's your very present help in trouble. And when we, when we grab a hold of just those, just those three things that it says about God in the first uh, verse there, that gives us everything we need to come to a really incredible conclusion in verse number two, if you look there. It says, therefore, we will not fear. You need the first verse to get to the second verse. He's got to be our refuge. He's got to be, we've got to come to him just emptied out, giving up, Done. Throw my hands up in the air. I can't win. And when we, in that place, we come to him, come to him as our refuge, come to him as our strength, come to him believing that he's, he, he wants to be our help and he is a very present help in, in trouble. It enables you to then think the next thought, which is that therefore we will not fear. We often, I think, breeze through God's word when we read it. And I found so much that when I just stop and go slower and just sit and think on what I just read and not take it for granted and just try to scrape every bit out of every word to see what God is trying to tell me about him, that, that it, makes, it makes all the difference the writer of this psalm, in light of the fact that God is our hiding place and our strength for the battle and our faithful and omnipresent help, uh, he can come to no other conclusion after that than to say, therefore, everything is okay. So you know, if, those, if everything in the, in the first verse is true, that's the only conclusion that you can come to. If, if you're just thinking through it logically, it's the only thing. It's the only end. Therefore, I don't have to worry. When God tells us things about himself, he's not just giving us information. He's not just giving us some, some, some academic things to store in our heads or Snapple facts that are meaningless, that we just collect and they don't do anything. They, they do something. Everything that God reveals about himself is for you. It's, it's for you, for your help. It has real implications for your life. If God says something about himself, do we believe it? And if so, what does it mean and how does it change things? What's, what's the conclusion in light of what we just in light of what God has just said, God wants to change our thinking. Romans 12, uh, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The renewing of your mind is, is, is one of God's goals in your life. Your sanctification, your conformity to the likeness of his son. We don't need to conform to the fear and concern of, of, of people who do not know God. We don't need to conform to that. Fear and concern are traits of the old nature that are still with us. But the truth of who God is, is revealed to us, and we have the, the right and the privilege to grab a hold of that and, and take that and, and actually live that out and, and not, not be afraid, not be worried, because we know who he is to us. He's your refuge. He's your help. He's your strength. He's your very present help. Therefore, we, don't, therefore we will not fear. Now, how far exactly does that, that go? To what degree do we not fear? And in what, in what sense exactly are we saying? Is, all of, is this all of the time, or is this just like a specific sort of a situation that, that comes up? Well, if you look at the rest of verse 2 and then all of verse 3, uh, we see a little more there. It says, uh, starting again at the beginning of verse 2, Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. And so the writer of the psalm, he's, it, it's a song. There's imagery. He's, he's painting. He's painting a picture for you to, to look at. And he paints this picture of this world around him in upheaval of the, the mountains being removed and carried into the midst of the sea and the waters being troubled and the mountains shaking. And so he uses that as like, the, as like a benchmark, as like the furthest uh, outer boundary of everything bad that could happen in life and says, even when it gets to here, therefore we will not fear. He has to make up something bad enough in order to make his point, only to say that uh, even this isn't bad enough to, to, warrant, to warrant the fear. The idea is that if, even if something that wild isn't enough to move someone who, who has their feet planted in God, then everything else that we more commonly deal with is, is just nothing in comparison. Even if the mountains were carried into the midst of the sea, we, th therefore we will not fear. And if we wanted to be imaginative about this, you could, you could call uh, the mountains the, like the biggest and strongest and most stable uh, things in your life, maybe. Your job, your, your finances, your, your relationships, your family. All the things that are, that are steady and always there. Uh, if those things were shaken and if those things were, were removed and life as you know it changed one day, God's still the same. He's still exactly the same. He's still exactly the same to you as, as he was before what, whatever that was came to be. He is still stable, and he is still, still true. And it's easy to see that those things are true, and, and they're even easier for us to say. Uh, but sometimes like I, I, I find that that's not always real in my heart. God's word often says the phrase, fear not. And... I often ask myself how, if, I'm, if I'm obeying that, if, I am, uh, if I'm believing him when he says something about himself, do, do I take him at his word to the degree that it makes me rest, that I trust in it? 
the thing about trials is that they, like, they, they try us. They, they show us what is in our heart. They, they, they prove us to see whether we will walk in his way or no. They make us see what we're made of. And, and they show where our faith needs some edifying and needs some building up. Bringing us to our wits end, emptying, our, emptying us of, of our pride and, and our self and our ego. Bringing us to forgiveness and, and strengthening and, and growth in, in Christ. And if you keep going in the psalm, verse 4 changes things a little bit. We take a break from talking about uh, the world we live in here and uh, all of the tumult in, in this life. And our eyes are turned somewhere else. They're turned upward to a, a more heavenly, peaceful scene. Look there in verse 4. It says, There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Right after the picture of the violent earthquakes and the swelling seas, we're given this new picture to look at. One with this peaceful uh, river there. And it's the complete opposite of, of what we just where we just were. There's no, there isn't the, the mountains shaking and, and everything in upheaval. It's just calm and steady and peace. And that contrast between those two, those two paintings there that the psalmist gives us is, is the level of, of the difference that we feel when we go into God our refuge. It's that stark. When we are at our most distress, we have somewhere to turn our eyes. The world has nowhere to look, but we do. Somewhere separate from all of, of, the, of the, the dread and the horrors that could, could come up in our day. Somewhere that doesn't shift and move like life. It's this, the city of God here. And as I read in this verse, as I read that, I couldn't like, help but think of uh, somewhere I had heard that before, and that was in Revelation 21.2. I'll just read it real quick. It says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, uh, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. There's, there's the city, and then the rest of that chapter um, it goes through the sizes and the dimensions of the city and all the types of the precious stones used in the gates. Uh, and then the, the first verse of the next chapter, Revelation 22, says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So, so the city with the river. And that's what we see in this psalm. This place. And you can only conclude that it's not the river and it's not the city. Um, it's God's presence. It's because God is there where that is. That's the thing that is making the difference. The second part of verse 4 is devoted to the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. The holy place of the tabernacle is where the high priest would come and meet with God. It's the place where if anyone but the high priest would go to, they would die. The place where, where, where God was. And the beautiful thing about our standing at, at, at this point in the in the progression of, of God's workings and dealings with mankind is that he's given us access to him in that way. The way that the priests would, because Jesus ripped the veil, uh, that we can go into God's presence wherever we, whenever we want to go to him. I love this verse so much in, ver in uh, Hebrews 4, verse 16. It says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is where we run to when, when we're troubled. We don't want to let that sit and 
poke at us and chip at us and gnaw at us. And I think so often we just kind of let it do that for like longer than, than we realize sometimes. We can humbly and yet boldly go to God and, and find the grace to meet whatever that thing is, no matter how small it is or no matter how big it is. There's a river that gently flows from the presence of God to refresh us. And so why don't we visit there, just, just visit there more. Go to him more purposefully, uh, with, with, with more decision, with, with less passivity and more of an active going. Uh, whenever, whenever there's the slightest need felt to be met. A lot of times it's because we're too busy looking at other things that make us glad, but they really don't in comparison. Things that don't truly refresh us and reassure us, things that don't really give us uh, the refuge that we need and the grace that we need and the help that we need. Sometimes we pray for a few minutes and nothing happens. And uh, you grow discouraged with it. You grow discouraged over time doing that because you just, you just sit there, you pray for a few minutes, nothing happens, and then that, it, it just keeps being that, that same process over and over, and then you just start to become resentful at the thought of, of going to God and s- taking aside time and sitting down to, to pray. But we need to be mindful of all of the self that, that is in that. Sometimes there's a touch of, I want it now, and if I can't get it now, fine, I'm going somewhere else. The Bible has so much to say about God's giving of grace that it's, it's, it's to the lowly, the lowly person, the humble person. That, that person who's just, they, they give up, and uh, they don't have any, any self-interest here. They just, they just, they just need they just need so much, and they just want to want to go to him and, and sit with him, and be with God, and and hold things up to him and, and and be reassured by him. God answers that that lowly heart. He will answer the prayer of those who, as as dear children, wait at his door uh, until until he gives the grace. Until he gives the grace. I think uh, when the need is felt, we have to pray until we get it. You know, like Jacob, when he would not let go of God until, until, he, until he blessed him. I think we just grow tired of, of waiting for it and just kind of give, it, give up thinking that God is going to, going to give it. But he wants to give it. He wants to give it. He wants to be our help. Look at this next verse. It says, uh, it's verse number five. It says, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. He shall help her. You feel... The writer's confidence that help is going to come, that he shall help, uh, that he is in the midst of her. He's, he's with you. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. Here's someone who believes that God cares about their, their distress, that, that God cares about, about their estate where they are right now in their life. And you feel their expectation they're expecting from God. They expect that he's going to help. And I look at my own heart, and there's a lot of times where I, I wouldn't want to admit it, but I'll be dealing with a problem, and I stop and think, and I realize that unconsciously, maybe I'm not saying it, but, but unconsciously when I look at you know, how, how I how I would approach the act of bringing this to God, I don't expect 
that anything is going to happen. And I don't expect that he is going to, to do anything. I just expect nothing. Do we expect that he really wants to help us and that he really will do it, that he's able and that he is willing? Or is there constantly a voice in our mind saying, I know what the Bible says, but is God actually going to do anything? Is he actually going to come through for me? We would avoid so much worry if we could only take God at his, at his word like, like little children when we read the things that we read in this psalm and we just say, yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. In this almost naive way, just allowing the words to be true. Just allow it to be in, in our hearts. It would be just unscathed by the heathen raging in, in verse number six because we know God just needs to utter his voice and, and the earth melts and the whole thing goes away. And, and in verse seven, we see the same confidence. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The same confidence in God, again, called our refuge, the place where we run to, the place where we hide. Verses 8 and 9, we remember the power and the sovereignty of God. It's he who, it, it, he, he's the one who allows the wars to be for now. Verse 9 there, he maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. He allows all of the things that are horrible, uh, whether it be wars or whether it be something else dreadful in, in our lives. He, he does allow it. He does. And he will end it. He, 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 d he does both. And he's the one in control. And that's the thing that, that we're confident in. He's the one who raises up the, the liberal politicians, and he is the one who will take them down. He raises up terrible bosses, and he puts them down. He does all of that. It's him. And then verse 10, it reads totally different from, from the rest. This, this is that, I think, probably the most well-known part of this psalm. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. And it feels like God's eyes just peel right through the pages. And like his hand just comes out and it is like trying to steady your, your trembling heart. It's like he's looking right at you when you read it. And in that still, small voice saying, be still, relax, relax. It's going to be fine. I know what is happening. I know where you are. I see you. And I, and I know everything that, that uh, is on you. And I allowed it on purpose. And I will end it. And I want to ease your trouble. Just be patient. Hide in me till it's over. Just got to rest in him. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for, for being someone who cares about us being a God who uh, that you're even mindful of us at all. Lord, we, we're amazed by that. And Lord, that you would even forgive us. Lord, we're, we're humbled so much by that. And Father, we pray that we, would, that we would believe you, that we would believe your every word, like little children. 
Lord, like, like, like naive children, naive to seeds of doubt concerning you and, and not needing to know things that we never needed to know, that, that we would just know and be assured of you. Lord, we pray that you would continue to help us be merciful to us and give us that strength and be our, be our, help us to find you to be truly our refuge. Lord, truly give us your strength and Lord, truly convince us that you really are right here with us in, in all of our, our trouble and all of our our trials and in all of the things that happen, that they, that they are nothing to you. Lord, we pray that you would help form that in us, help us to be more like your son. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm.